between us um, for that time. We um, hope to get a, a banner that we can put outside to kind of announce that we are going to be having a candlelight service on Christmas Eve here so that you people, you know, can be thinking, oh, well, I can do last minute shopping and go to church. So, you know, some sort of thing. So we could get um, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day are some of the biggest days people attend church, believe it or not. So it might be a wonderful opportunity to um, to uh, have people know that we're here and experience um, this our type of worship and, and everything. So I think that's all I had. Oh, one more thing. Um, Tristan has... He, he told me, he said, I'm just amazed at how many pictures he's getting from you all, that the ones that y'all took during construction, you've been so bad at forward them to, he's not gotten a single one. So please get your pictures to him. We need them for the website. We need them to set something up. So he, we can't do that, and we only have a few more weeks with Tristan, so we can't do that until he gets the pictures. So if you have pictures on your phone, on your camera, please get them to him as soon as you can. And also, y'all have been so much better at signing up about volunteering when you're going to be here at the mall, um, here in the in the building. So would you con- please continue to do that? It helps Curtis and I know um, when we can be home or when we can have a, you know, some time to get other, our other <laughs> business <laughs> accomplished and done. So thank you for, for doing that. But if you could c- be sure and do that as frequently as often, let us know that you're going to be here. That would be great. Would you go look for my mom? Mm-hmm. Yes, and if you have signed up and something comes up, we totally understand that, but just let us know if you're not going to be here. It's amazing how many people, I mean, you never know who's going to stop by or when they're going to stop by. There's no set hours when people are more likely to drop in. Sometimes the morning's real busy, sometimes the afternoon's real busy, sometimes the evening's real busy. So if we we can keep the, the doors open, you know, as much as possible, it's amazing. It was amazing the people that, uh, that came by today. I mean, yeah, there was at least eight encounters uh, of people really getting touched by the Lord today. At least eight. And then we had uh, three visitations by the enemy, and uh, which was uh, quite interesting. So I, I, I rejoice because uh, the meetings that we had today with different people, they were, they were major breakthroughs of revelation of uh, that God is here, that his son is real, and that they can go on in their relationship with the Lord into real intimacy, into really knowing him, into really walking with him. Uh, it seems like that's been kind of the general theme of the uh, last couple of three weeks of people making that discovery because uh, I, I, our hope, our whole hope is that Jesus is in our midst, according to Titus 3, 5. Our hope is supposed to be latched around the thought process of his great appearing in our midst. That's not the second coming of him making his manifest presence known to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in such, the Holy Spirit then personifies the Son, and the Son uh, says to the Holy Spirit, fill them more, and the Holy Spirit says, uh, I'll show them you more, and the Lord says, fill them more with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit says, I'll fill them more and show them you. <laughs> and, and so it just glory to glory to glory, and it, it, experiential thought process is what God is calling us to instead of the mundaneness of just sitting on a pew and really not knowing our God. There's a lot of empty uh, 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 boxes of cereal out there. And you you know, if you've come out of those areas of how dry and empty it has been. Uh, I, I don't know why, but God has chosen us to deliver his word, and his word uh, is absolutely blows me away, and I know it blows you away too. Uh, but he's put it in our midst, and we have that to share with people, his word. I I, uh, I saw the spirit move on Pat. There was a visitor we had yesterday, and a, <coughs> a guy was talking about that he, he was going to XY Church, and, and uh, 
you know, of, you know, what makes you guys different? And before I could even answer, Pat said, well, I'll tell you what's different. It's like I, I, God is real here. It's like he, he's come alive. It's like, it's like the word really gets, ex- I was starving to death out there. You know what it's like, man. And God is here. <laughs> I'm like, go Pat. <laughs> now that's the Holy Spirit moving on someone with true testimony of what he, he was giving testimony, that what God was doing to him, how God was meeting him. And instead of getting into philosophical debates or trying to help people learn their theology or trying to understand scripture, Satan will talk about those things all day and so will people express to them what God has done in your life right here in this place and it will make it attractive to them for them to come and be with God. We're going to be having some uh, evangelistic classes uh, coming up uh, sometime. I, I, you know, I, I don't understand this. I, I, I have talked with some pastors in times past. Man, I, you know, I, I didn't, I'm afraid I'm going to run out of sermon material. And then I'm, I fear I can't get it all in in my lifetime. Because I, I got, the Lord's given me so many things to, to teach that, of how we can get into his prayer, how we know, how, and, and all the intricate mechanics about it. And I look at it as this, uh, this, this huge clockworks, the size of the universe with every small gear and cog in it in place that can get us, uh, every one of them has something to do with the other one. So I sometimes grieve inside that I can't express to you uh, all the things at once that, I mean, I could. I mean, we, we could stand and talk from now to the end of eternity, and we would not have covered all the things that God has for us to know about him that brings the revelatory process into us for us to truly connect to him. Now, with that said, I would like you to know from time to time we, we have some challenges here, too. Today we had a particularly good challenge, and I'm sitting there at the table, and the guy comes up and well, religious thing here, huh? <laughs> My, I looked and I saw demonic forces and I saw someone that was truly one of Satan's agents standing there. Then he crossed the line and I thought, you're standing on God's ground. And then he, so you're a 5013C, huh? You're government agency, huh? <laughs> you know, and he's really stressing and really, nah, yeah, oh, you, know, you don't have to be a 5013. You don't have to belong to the government. You don't have to do this. And uh, Lord, I, I thought, okay, do I just let him rattle on so he runs out of juice and, and, and it will go his way? The guy had no intent. He edged closer. I went, oh, I got to get him off of God's ground. And finally, I just said, sir, you are Satan's agent. And you need to get off his ground. You need to leave. What? <laughs> you know, I mean, that guy kind of went kind of sideways. And, and, and finally, I said, what, what do I do? And he said, invoke me. Tell him what it's going to be like when he stands next to me. And I said, sir, I'm going to be standing next to Jesus Christ and God the Almighty when he casts you into the lake of fire because you are Satan's agent. Now leave. That is the truth. Yes, he left. And my, my point is, is you may not have the authority to do that. I do. But if you get hit, I know um, uh, Jennifer was up here, and she had a real visitation from some guy that was in leagues with Satan. It really caused some confusion for her and some hurt for her. You, you don't have to. If someone wants to come onto God's ground and uh, turn the world upside down and they've got special things going on, just say, sir, you have no part here. And I'm telling you this because you're acting as host on God's property. And, and you know, of course, you do need to pray. And, Lord, what's going on here? You do, you do need to pray. But if the person is just a divisive person, listen to the Lord and all that stuff. And don't deal with it in your flesh. That's not my instruction. Uh, my instruction is we are right on the cutting edge, just like Paul was and Peter was, of the world going by. And we've got all kinds of spiritual things. There's going to be all kinds of spiritual assignments of God that are going to be given to us for rescue missions. 
But in the midst of that, there's also going to be, like, remember the girl that heckled Paul and followed him around? <laughs> oh, these men are of God. He finally, uh, do you know, he finally rebuked the devil that was there. And uh, it caused a great stir. Why did he do that? Because he had the work of God to do. And I just want you to know, we have the work of God to do. We have a very special, privileged position that God has placed us in to do the work of God. And you don't have to see these things, but know that God is very well capable of handling things like that. And I don't want you to feel defeated when one of those assignments tries to walk through the door. Instead, know your God. It is his ground. And they, too, will stand before him. And they, too, will give an account. And they, too, if they have threatened his ground, will be cast into the lake of fire. They don't know him. That's a truth, right? And I did express to the guy, uh, you will be in the lake of fire unless you come to Jesus Christ and you make him your Lord. So that's the first time the man ever heard someone directly tell him the end result and how to resolve the great problem of being cast into the lake of fire. So I rejoice in that assignment, too, because it could become fruitful. It could become fruitful. So as you are the Lord's agent here, being a host to introduce people to him, to God, that, that, that's what we're trying to do in us as manning the fort here, is introduce people to God. Uh, don't try to be their theologian. Don't try necessarily to discuss Scripture with them. They may know scripture better than you. I can tell you, Satan knows better scripture better than I do. Uh, he, he knows it better than anybody on the face of the earth. But what they can't discuss with you is what God has personally done in you, you being here, and the revelatory process of him. So I, I just absolutely rejoice. I saw the Spirit sovereignly move on my brother, and what he had to say was 10,000 times more important than what I was saying to the man. And what he had to say impacted the man so deep that it, it stirred him passionately. Of, oh, my goodness. So I, I, I praise God. Let the Holy Spirit just, just move on you. Yeah, you just be you, and you express how God has delivered you and how he speaks to you and what the word is like and what God is doing for you here. That's what people are looking for. Yeah. I, 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 I want to uh, get into the word uh, uh, anybody from Texas on right now? Okay, We're, we don't have that going on. So how, do you, I'll give you a choice. Do you want to do the word first or worship first? That's a question in your, for you, you know? <laughs> word. 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 Everybody that wants to do the word first, raise your hand, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine, okay. Ten. <laughs> I, I didn't give that option. <laughs> well, maybe we can do the word and then we can ease off into worship. It's about 25 after 6. And let me. <clears throat> it must. going to be a real hot message. <laughs> it's really hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> you want my sweater? <laughs> I'd like to say hello to the people out there that have joined us, and we praise God, and thank you for joining us. And it's not too late, if you're here local, to run down and be a part of the body. And if you're there in Texas, uh, across the nation, we thank you for joining us, and pray that his word uh, just absolutely liberates you and sets you free. Shall we, uh, shall we bow our hearts before the Lord? Lord, we humbly come before you, and uh, we distinctly state to you that we need your breath in us. We need the freshness and the revelation of you and your truth to penetrate our dark hearts and our dark minds. And you need, we need you to bring the, the light of your presence into our thought process. Oh, Lord, and your, your great truth. We, we cannot accomplish these things unless you come and meet with us. We, we have no hope unless you come and stand in our midst and reveal yourself to us. So open our minds and our ears to be able to receive your word, that it would be transforming in our hearts, so much so that, Lord, we would just want to dance before you. 
We ask you to come and embrace us with your great word now. In Jesus' name. Do you agree with me? Amen? Amen? I'd like to... In uh, Exodus, in the 19th chapter, uh, in the third month after the Israelis left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai after they had set out from Rephidim. They entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. I was debating on whether to call this message the gospel of the desert, but I think it should be the gospel of the desert meeting because we have a desert of our life when we're coming out of Egypt, out of our own self-willed ways, our own actions and own animosities and angers. And you realize also the Israelis were religious. They had a form of some form of religion. Matter of fact, they even tried to practice that religion the next day, did they not? Right there at the bottom of the mountain. And it was some offering and revelry and making a golden calf and let's party down. And <clears throat> they had a confusing thing going on in their heart. Who was God? Was there old ways and their old thought processes? And uh, was that God? Was that the one that brought them out there? Because they actually made the proclamation. Uh, it was this golden calf to deliver you. Remember the priests started talking to them. And, and well, they weren't priests yet. But they were priests from Egypt of the old ways. Uh, they started trying to convince the children of Israel that uh, the worship of the golden calf would be best. Because after all, I mean, the golden calf is the one that's taken care of you for 400 years. And you're still alive. Yes, you were a slave, but you're still alive. I mean, if it hadn't been for the golden calf, you, you wouldn't have been alive at all. So the, there was some strong dissuasion by the enemy to get this God's people that was coming out of captivity, coming out of one realm of reality and truth, of the only thing that they knew, coming into another realm of reality and truth, something they could not see nor understand, a truth that was not truth to them yet, although it was going to be made plain to them. Now, they needed a place for this to take place of an encounter with a living God. They needed to find out there was a living God. <clears throat> so, I think <clears throat> in the gospel, which is uh, this wide expanse of details from God, of how we are to approach him and how we're to fellowship with him and what regulations and rules he has set for that approach and for us to have encounters with him. Because was that not the purpose of the desert? So when we're coming out of our lives and we walk in church and we come into a different thought process and different understanding than what we once knew. And, I, and I'm not, I, let me re rephrase that. We walk into a place where God's presence is because there's many deserts that are called churches because the scripture says in the last days that the church will basically turn from Jesus Christ. They'll become pseudo churches and his presence won't be there. So there are many empty buildings of his presence that are filled with people who want to worship the golden calf. I find it interesting that uh, people will really chide the Catholics uh, for selling indulgences. You know what indulgences was? That, that meant that if you wanted to have a party where everybody, uh, I'm, I'm talking about wild party where everybody's doing everything foul that there is and drinking everything and drugs and uh, sexual activity of every kind, then you could go to the Catholic church if you were wealthy and Man, how many, how many guests are on your list? What's the guest name? How important are those guests? Oh, well, you got this guest? I mean, if you're going to have that guest, I mean, for us to excuse what you're going to do there, uh, you, it would cost you about 10000 for that one, 2000 for this one. Oh, this one, oh, this one's a Mickey Mouse one, 600 for this one. And when you got through, you tallied it up, and you would pay the church maybe $150,000, and now you get to go have the party of your life. <clears throat> under the auspices that now those sins are forgiven, therefore you can go ahead with your party. They've been paid for. Now, I'd submit to you that just flies in the face of everything that says God, right? Yeah. It just enrages me that the church would authorize such thing. 
They authorized it so that they could get money. They authorized sin so that they could get something. Well, I, I, I would say this about the church today. They're far more foolish because they're authorizing the same thing, but they're not even demanding payment. They just say you can do it free. It's okay for you to go sin. It's okay for you to shack up. It's okay for you to do these, these, these sins of darkness. And it's free. It's all on the basis of Jesus. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. Now, the reason I'm saying this, because if we're going to meet with the living God, which the ultimate factor in this is every one of us is going to stand in front of the great white throne of judgment and give an account even for every idle word. We're going to give an account for all the untruths that we intentionally believed. We're going to give an account for all the truth of God that we threw down and said, no, I don't want your truth. I, I want to do it my way. I'm not going to accept that as truth. I've got a different kind of truth. That's not my truth. We're going to give an account before him, and we will not be able to argue with him. <coughs> he will point, there's a lake of fire. Now speak. What did you do and what did you not do? So there's going to be great confession on our part in that meeting. So I would suggest to you that <clears throat> the gospel of the meeting is an important factor that we need to understand. One of the first meetings that took place was without the insulating factor of the Lord Jesus being there. Now, there's a passage in the book of Hebrews that says, <clears throat> you have not come to a mountain that, has, that you cannot touch. You've not come to a mountain that has trumpets blasting so much that it splits your ears wide open. You've not come to a mountain where the voices are commanding and saying the things of God and the laws of God so loud that it bursts your mind. You've not come to a mountain that rocks are splitting open where the ground is shaking. You've not come to a mountain where fire has descended from heaven and the presence of a living, judging God is standing there. That is not the meeting that he's calling you to at this time. Now, that's good news, is it not? But we need to look and see there is going to be a meeting that's going to be far more serious now. The scripture calls it the great and dreadful day. Yeah, there, in, in the recorded history, in the word, there's no such thing that we've encountered as the great and dreadful day yet. <laughs> there has never been a great and dreadful day. Even the flood was not referred to as a great and dreadful day. So when our Lord Jesus comes and we're going to meet him, it's referred to as the great and dreadful day where men's hearts will literally fail them for fear. I would submit to you, it is those who do not know or recognize our Lord Jesus Christ as king, it is those who have flirted with sin, those who have ignored him, those who have despised him, those who have rejected him, and of course, the world. I just, I was telling you the list that's in the church. <laughs> Not the world, the world, it, it doesn't know him anyway. I'm referring to us in the church. Now, these judgments will be made to us in the church. And now, what is the Lord trying to show us in this gospel of the meeting or the truth that we're going to have a meeting with the living God. <clears throat> well, I, in my opinion, he sets down for Israel, which Israel is a type and shadow of the church. I think we're all in agreement about that. The, the, the journey of the transformation between Egypt or the deliverance from Egypt is supposed to be us saying, Lord, I, I, I want to come out of Egypt and us coming out of the bondage of Satan. That's what Egypt represents a, a true bondage of a true kingdom and a true king that once possessed us and had all rights to the manner of our life and our futures and our children's life and the, and, and, the, and the general outcome that we would never belong to God, that we would never be his people. And so God made a way for us to come out. We looked at the gospel the three different Gospels. I think this is the fourth one now. And all these make up just one Gospel. They're just different segments in there. So I, I think that we really need to look at the Gospel of the first meeting. It says, then, <clears throat> And Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. I find it significant that it was three months later, 90 days. I can honestly tell you I don't know of anyone that if they really start out 
and make a true journey away from who they once were in slavery with every demonic force hounding them that within three months they could not be totally free and encamped at the base of the mountain of God to begin to learn about him and face-to-face -face revelatory experiences with God so that they could learn his terms of fellowship and his terms of relationship. Now, I, I find that holy. I find that also sovereign of him. It's the first principle that's laid down in Scripture. And I find it significant that God would make note in his word. I want you to know, it was exactly three months to the day, that's what the Scripture says, that they, from the time they left Egypt to the time they had arrived at their first encounter with the living God. So I would submit to you that if we stay on track with God, any new convert within three months could have made it to the mountain of God where they could have encounters with him. But now they have to be prepared for that encounter. So there's some preparations that are made for them to have prepare for that encounter. Now the problem is I find most Christians when they receive Jesus Christ, they maybe wonder for... Ten years before they really realize, ah, I, you know, I, 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 before they even hear that there could be a place that you could go to meet with God. It, 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 it took a spiritual leader like Moses to say, we're going to meet with God. That's the purpose of us leaving <laughs> over here and then beyond meeting with God. Remember, that's what he told Pharaoh. L let God's people go so they can go meet with him. And all the children of Israel, what was their thought? That we're going to go meet with God. That was the purpose. It was not the promised land to start off with. Now, the promised land was something that was introduced a little bit after that, that God's going to give you the promised land, but the first premise of them leaving Egypt was to go meet with their God and worship their God. So our first premise in us truly leaving Egypt and us truly, uh, our, 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 our objective should be to meet with God. Now that can be accomplished no matter what kind of heretic we are. If we lay down all of our teachings and what we think we know of our wonderings and our ramblings and our, our so-called false gospels that we hold, we need to get in our heart, we need to meet with God because he's the only one that can give us relevant truth. Remember, our, the truth that we had was Egyptian truth. And the truth that we have when we're crossing the desert is a flawed truth of us not totally being changed from being an Egyptian. We've been delivered from Egypt, but we have not had the change of heart, which he is saying, I, I want to give you, an, I'm going to get you in a position to give you a new heart. Now, for most people that call themselves Christians, what do I need a new heart for? Uh, Jesus entered me and, uh, well, we need a new heart because the old heart can't receive the truths of God to where we can have the meeting with him. The new heart can receive the instructions needed so that we can have meetings with the living God. So Moses, he says, in Moses went up, they're camped in front of the mountain. That's just, that's, that, that, that should be a, a marvelous thought that we truly even in our state, that Jesus can bring and deposit us where we can begin to assemble ourselves and sit at the foot of the mountain of the living God. We have not yet begun to try to climb it to get up into his presence. Matter of fact, there's one passage of scripture, who can ascend the holy mountain? It is he with clean hands and a pure heart. So there has to be some changes at the base of the mountain in order to prepare us to have a meeting with the living God. Now the problem was they didn't have the insulating factor of Jesus Christ, which is full of mercy and full of grace, to insulate them against the harsh judgments that God would have to make. He would have to make that. They're filled with evil. They're filled with sin. Their, their heart is not for God. They do not want to know God. But God, based on a promise that he made to their forefathers and based upon their sovereign cry. Remember, he's, he heard the cries of Israel. So who are they praying to? Oh, God, save us. Now, they don't know what saved looks like. <laughs> they don't know what salvation looks like. Their mind's eye is, would we just need to get out of Israel? 
That's what most of us think, or not Israel, out of Egypt. And that's what most of us think salvation is. Well, what is out of Egypt? The desert. So we not only need to be saved out of Egypt, we also are going to be need to cross the desert, which that crossing is significant without God, if not impossible. Matter of fact, God had them go around a certain way because the, the, the Philistines were too strong and would destroy them if they went another way. So God had them go a specific path to not encounter other agents of Satan so that God, meanwhile, is going to raise up a mighty army that can obey him and hear him for their safety, for their safety. Now, one of the first altars that Moses built before he built the altar of the tabernacle was uh, there was a battle that was going on and, and uh, this this battle I think it's in the 17th chapter of Exodus the Amalekites uh, the Amalekites was on them uh, the Amalekite nation was millions of people and they showed up with great strength they personally wanted to take out the Israelites they personally attacked the Israelites Israelites didn't challenge them. They, the Amalekites came to challenge them. And so Moses, he is taken up to the top of a mountain, and he's standing with the rod of God. I think that's just really cool. And we don't think there's any power in it. But God said that was his staff, that the power that Jesus has was in his staff. And that staff was given to Moses. It was the rod of God. It, it literally had power of God in it. And when this rod struck the water, it caused the water to part. That's what Scripture said. It, the rod, caused the water to part. And now, so Moses is seeing this battle that's fixing to take place, and he gives Joshua instructions. You go fight them. You kill our enemies. I'm going to go up here and pray. I'm going to be overlooking so I can pray and see what's going on so I can pray. But I want you to know this, Joshua. God has told me to hold this rod up, that you'll be victorious as I hold this rod up against the Amalekites. Now, see, not only have we had the enemy come after us from Egypt, but we will have the enemy come after us from many different directions trying to destroy the work of God. Now, the rod of God, the authority of God is the one that, the thing that needs to be lifted up. That, that Moses, he climbs up the hill, and Aaron goes with him, and uh, 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 forget the other guy. Pardon? Her. That's right. Ben Hur. <laughs> Judah Ben Hur. Man, how, he was in that movie, wasn't he? <laughs> well, no, it's just her. It's not a girl. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're up there, and Moses, he starts raising the rod, and Joshua was engaging with this huge army, and as he holds the rod up, the Amalekite army is being destroyed. When Moses' arms got tired and he no longer could hold the resident power of God up, then the Amalekites started winning. Now, Aaron and Hur saw this, so one on each side, they set Moses down on a rock, and they lifted his hands up with him holding the rod. And the power of God was released so much that they totally smited the, uh, the, uh, the Amalekites. And as a result, God made a proclamation to Moses. He says, you tell Joshua, this is written down in the annuals of heaven. Forever and ever this is written down. And he said, I, I, I want you to know that uh, because of this, there was, there was a, a real blessing that was invoked upon them, that God himself would be their defender. And that's where the name Jehovah Nisi comes from. That matter of fact, that we used to sing a song, his banner over me is law. What, 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 what that word that's kind of mistranslated banner, no, he, the rod of his authority and his presence, if we lift that up, it will go before us and it will 
be the proclamation of God to control the enemies that want to overflood our life. Now, what were the enemies sent for? To make sure that they didn't make it to the mountain to meet with the God. Because if they made it to the mountain and became God's people, then they would be a people too powerful to contend with. They would be a people that could not be defeated because God would be for them. But right now, they're not a part of God. They don't look like God. They don't smell like God. They don't act like his people. They act like the Egyptians. So Moses' task is to get them to the mountain so there can be the transformation. Now, did you see the application to us as a church? The enemy is wanting to distract us and to come and engage him or lag behind. Matter of fact, there was always Israelites that didn't want to be obedient and they just well okay there I go again I'm, I'm got, man I just got my garden planted here I mean we've been here for seven months and the tomatoes are almost ripe the squash is almost ripe oh my goodness I fertilized them with that rotten manna stuff and man it grows it's miracle grow you know and, and, and I just about got and you want to move I don't know about this <laughs> Camps moving, you know, and the Malachites are always watching as they were going across the desert. And those who were slow to be obedient to that staff, I should have recognized that's the rod of God that guy's got up there. Because that rod was also transferred to Joshua. That's a rod of God that's up there. And so they didn't recognize that, and by lagging behind, uh, many of them perished there in the desert by not being having reverential respect for the authority of God. Now, but keep in mind, what were the Malachites trying to do? They were trying to prevent that meeting of the children of Israel with a God that was a powerful God. They saw his power. They saw the Egyptian army decimated. An army estimated to be a million and a half strong coming after the children of Israel. They saw the dead bodies of a million and a half men floating and all over the beaches and all the horses and the chariots and everything that was there. They saw. And the Amalekites, they're witnessing. And the Philistines, they're watching this. This is no small thing. Every nation that's represented that is in front of where Israel might possibly have had agents and ambassadors there to see and watch from the hills of who is this people that's coming. And man, they were frightened to death when they saw God Almighty split the waters and, and the children of Israel come through. And they were Ten times more frightened when an entire Egyptian army was put to death right there in front of their eyes. And so they must cut off that meeting with God. So I can tell you all the assignments that we get from the enemy is to defer us from being able to meet with the living God. Even though we're defiled, even though we have wrong truth, even though we're a mess, even though we don't agree with him, we still need to get to the bottom of his mountain where truth can be found. I would call the mountain the mountain of truth. It is a mountain, brilliant and glorious, a mountain of truth, what we need. It is what we need. But I can tell you, if we do not go with Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to help us in camp there, we couldn't handle the truth if we saw it. And I can tell you, most Christians can't handle the truth. They can't handle the truth of, no, you're wicked when you do this. Or, no, you shouldn't be that argumentative. Or, no, you shouldn't demand your way. No, you shouldn't be fussing and fighting. I'm telling you, we, 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 if we saw that and the, and the great judgments that were hanging up there on the sides of the hills, we would, oh, my God. I, I can't handle that truth. I don't want to stop doing that. That person might win. That person might get their way. And well, what are you, some kind of control freak? <laughs> Not wanting them to have their way? Well, whose way got made here? You know? I can tell you it's going to be God's way or the highway to hell. God's way or the highway to hell. There is no other road. It is God's way. It is God's will, God's way. So the gospel of our meeting, the truth is, we're not capable of having this meeting with the living God without assistance. The Israelites had the assistance of Moses and the assistance of God himself and the assistance of some mighty angels that were there. This is recorded that went before them and was also behind them as their protector. So there was an entourage of heavenly host that were helping the children of Israel and God gives them Simple instructions. 
He says, Moses, you be sure and tell the people, don't come up on the mountain yet. If they do in their current state, with them looking like Israel, with them hating me and despising me and wanting and desire, I'm telling you that my judgments would hit them. There's nothing to insulate them from my judgments. For I am a holy God. I'm a perfect God, and I made human beings to be perfect. And these beings, there's imperfection. This, this, this vessel full of sewage, if it touches my mountain, I'm telling you, you better stone it or you better shoot it with some arrows. You better, even if it's an animal, you better not let it come into my presence. Because they hadn't been sanctified yet. They hadn't been prepared. They weren't prepared for a real meeting with the living God. I think that's pretty fair deal of God instead of just yeah let's all run up the hill and you know about half of them fry and die <laughs> wait a minute was there something we were supposed to do <laughs> no he, he told me don't break out don't try to come to me your way listen to Moses I'm going to speak to him and he can prepare you to have a meeting with me now <laughs> evidently they didn't want to do that or God wouldn't be giving instructions Matter of fact, I, I can tell you most of the time we want to get rid of leaders. Out of my way, there's a mountaineer's gun. I'm headed up the hill myself. I'll meet with him. <laughs> and God said, oh, you, you don't want anything between me and you. And so he shows them what they'll be facing. Here's who you'll face. And God himself descends with a dark cloud. And man, I, 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 do you know that God knows what darkness is? <laughs> I'm not talking about a little shadow in the sky of a little thunderstorm from Texas that goes up 50,000. He says he descended out of this other cosmos or out of this other dimension so much that light disappeared where it came from. And as a result, his presence touched down on the earth. And what was he, what was he doing? He was insulating us from him. I ask you, what did the Egyptians see? when the, they were coming after the Israelis and the Israelis were right on the water and they had no place to go. It says that God sent an angel or fire or perhaps it was him. We don't know. There's connotations of all three. He sent a fire, but that fire on one side of it was a fire to light for the whole camp of Israel, but the other side... It was total darkness that they could not see. Why? Why should they be privileged to any light? The Egyptians weren't privileged to the light. So I, I, it, it suggests if we're seeing the backside of darkness, we're not yet privileged to see light. Because Moses went up into God's presence. Do you think he saw light? Do you think there's light where God is? Matter of fact, God hides his face he's so brilliant he, he he even at passing by when God passed by he hid and just let him see the hinder parts of him because the brilliance and the radiance of God is 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 is, is absolutely splendid so I would suggest that them seeing the dark cloud is evidence of us being in darkness of not being able to see nor behold nor really want truth we, they really didn't want truth because God, when he started speaking, rocks were splitting and every person there heard his voice and it was too overpowering for them. It was so frightful that we never want to meet God. We never want to go up there. We, you, you talk to him. We, we, we don't want to go there. Now, 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 isn't it gracious of God that we don't, we have the blood of Jesus and the grace and mercy that Jesus can extend to us so that we don't meet God like that because it would put such fear within us that we would not want to have that meeting on a continual basis. Instead, so God's giving us of what it looks like to have that kind of meeting with the great living God. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you're to say to the house of Jacob and what you're to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings 
and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is already mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I would submit to you, it has not changed. Jesus chooses his fivefold priesthood, and then there's the holy nation. Us becoming a nation, a people of God together. He has not changed his concept of what the meeting is for. It's to establish us as a people of God. And establish his priesthood, a, a, a holy priest. We've we got to have somebody in charge to, that, 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 that God can speak to, to, to tell us, that, man, if you touch the mountain, you're dead. Because in our wicked ways, we want to approach God on our terms. And you, see, you can't approach me on your terms. So we have these mindsets and false truths about the so-called free liberty that we have, which the scripture says, don't use your newfound liberty in Christ for an occasion to the flesh. And that occasion to the flesh is us, one of the occasions of the flesh, because there's many, is that we would approach God on our terms. It has to be on the terms of Jesus Christ. It has to be, that's why he came to, to teach us his ways, because he has access past the mountain. He has abilities to transfer his rights to being a son into us so the father doesn't recognize us as the wicked Egyptian that we possibly are or have been. <clears throat> yeah, it would, would it make you nervous if... Uh, 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 you were dressed like an Egyptian back then and you didn't prepare your heart and, and you decided, well, I'm going to go up and stand in front of him and, and God looked down and he, what are you doing here, Egyptian? I mean, it'd be, you'd, it would be a nervous time for you because we didn't, we, don't ha we didn't go through the transforming process of sitting at the foot of the mountain and following the instructions. His comment before we died, what are you doing here, Egyptian? So, what are you doing here, flesh man? How, how, how did you climb in? What door did you come through? Because I didn't give you access. Remember the, the, the man that shows up and he's not in wedding clothes at the banquet of God? And, and, and God, what are you doing here? How come you didn't dress? Now, dress, of course, always refers to the righteousness of the saints. Our righteous acts out of Jesus Christ making us righteous. Now we start doing righteous things, and we stop doing the Egyptian things. And he said, you know, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. Get him away from me. Get him away from me. So I, God is trying every way that there is from different angles to teach us that we need meetings with him. Matter of fact, so much so that Jesus Christ wants to establish a continual meeting that he would walk and abide with us. That Jesus Christ wants to even bring his Father to have a meeting with us. And that Jesus and the Father, the Father sent the Holy Spirit to us and Jesus endorsed that he would send the Holy Spirit also. The two of them say, ah, we're going to send the other member of the Godhead and will you listen to him? Because you're going to be at the bottom of the mountain. I paid the way for you to cross the river. I've got the Holy Staff. Now, will you let him bring you to the bottom of my mountain where you can begin to see that I am the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I can not only keep you free, but any battle or anything of the Malachites that want to attack you, I'm Jehovah Nisi. I'll, I'll take care of that. You don't worry about it. You just, you just make sure that you prepare yourself to come to the meeting and follow my instructions so that you can be sanctified to meet with you. See, they still didn't get a chance to meet with him yet. The bottom of the mountain and trumpets are blowing. And, but God's intent, purpose for the meeting is that we would become his people. He's not changed that. So I, I think a, a real gospel that we need to really tie into our heart is the truth. Why does God give us so many instructions? You know, people say, why does he make it hard on us? Well, what's going to be hard is when you're cast into hell 
if you didn't know Jesus and do it his way. That's going to be, it's going to be an extremely hard day. And all the other fabrications of us having a hard life are false. Instead, God is trying to teach us how to walk in his presence so we can have a continual meeting with him through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I, I would say the principles of the doctrine of the gospel of meeting with God. We need to look and see if we're going to meet God on our own. If we're going to meet him, then we're going to have grave, grave problems in our relationship with the living God. If we're going to meet with him without the comfort of Jesus and the instructions of the Holy Spirit, then we're going to have some grave, grave problems. Are you in agreement with that? And so Moses was there and he was saying, oh, oh, people, don't, don't, don't rush up on the hill. No, don't even touch the hill. You, you don't understand. There's some, there's some real problems that, that, that could occur. I mean, that God has commanded that anything that touches Holy Mountain die. And he doesn't want you to die. He didn't want this scene to be just a bloodbath of you. He didn't bring you out here for that. So God did not call us to himself that we would be tormented by him. Someone else is the tormentor, and that's Satan, right? And his demonic forces. So our participation with Satan and Egypt allowed the tormentors to come and bring great depression upon us and great confusion where we kind of wander around and don't come in and settle down just right at the bottom of his mountain. I mean, we should be pleased. I know, he's up there. I'm just going to wait right here. But I need some instruction. We're supposed to be praying, Lord, I need your instructions about how this meeting is supposed to take place. I really want the meeting. And Jesus said, uh, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Who was he saying that to? Was he not talking to the disciples and the apostles? He didn't say that to the world. He, he said, where two or three meet in my name, I will come and be in their midst. Who is he talking to? He's talking to those that would meet at the bottom of the hill and be willing to cry out, oh, God. I need such transformation. I need such help from your Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord Jesus, I, I constantly do it wrong. And I, I, I still got the golden calf in my pocket. I, I need your help. Now, what God did at, there at the bottom of the mountain is let the golden calf come out, didn't he? And why did he do that? He, see, he, he could have told them ahead. Now, look, tomorrow about 4 o'clock, you guys are going to have a wing ding of a party, and you're going to build a golden calf, and then Aaron the liar over there, he's going to say, man, all I did is just throw some gold in the fire, and it, boom, the calf just came out. I mean, just trot it out on its own. I mean, God could have told them the truth of what they were going to do the next day. So he wanted that to come out, did he not? So there's many things that happen at the bottom of the mountain that get flushed out of us so that we can truly see the state of our soul so that we can truly understand of how much repentance we need to do and how much truth that we lack. We need his truth and it's up on the top of the mountain. We need the truth that he wants to give us and this mountain of truth from the bottom of it to the top of it will kill anything that's flesh and we ought to go woohoo about that. Unless, of course, we want to keep the flesh. See, it's the flesh that whines. I don't want to die. <laughs> and it's the spirit man that says, yeah, you're going to die. <laughs> Praise God. Die, die, flesh man, die. <laughs> Instead, we're saying, well, you know, the flesh man said, y if you go up there, I mean, that's going to be so hard. You're going to have to do this and that. Oh, you're going to have to put up with this, and that person's got this mouth, and you won't be able to retaliate, and you, that person says this and that. You won't have it. You'll lose control on the mountain. You've got to give up your control. Granted, you will have to give up your control. But if we give up control, who will be our champion? Jehovah Nisi, my banner is over you. At the bottom of the mountain, his banner was over them. Even if they made a calf, his banner was still over them. And he did not destroy them. So I know we've, since we've come to Jesus, there's probably many things that we've done that, and many things that we've resisted him in. If he did not burn them with fire, and there was Moses, a man that was intervening, and he listened to him, how much more will he listen to his son? Then, Father, Father. 
I'll take the flames, put them on me. But I'm going to cleanse your people. And I'm going to prepare them for a meeting with you. And then he comes down and he says, Will you prepare a meeting for me and with me? Will you get to know me? Because I can take you there. And I want you to have all these truths. You're going to need them in order to enter the gate. And I'm going to send my Holy Spirit as a part of me. And he's going to bring truth that there is a mountain of truth. And there is this meeting that you can have with the Father and you can have with me. Do you, do you want that meeting? Because see, that's a real question we need to be asked by him. Do you really want to meet him? Do you really want to hear him? Do you, do you really want that? There's a passage of scripture that uh, uh, Jesus is being questioned by Pilate. And Jesus answered, my kingdom's not of this world because Pilate's pressing. Are you a king? <laughs> He's trying to get him to say something so he has a right to crucify him. He says, my kingdom's not of this world, Pilate. If my kingdom were of this world, then uh, my holy servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews by you. <laughs> Who was he delivered to? The Jews, not the Romans. Romans didn't have anything to do with it. They were just the instrument that God used. But now, I want you to know, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? <laughs> and Jesus answered, you say right that I am a king. As a matter of fact, it was for this very cause that I was born. And for this cause, I also have come into the world to be king. That I should bear the witness to the truth. What is he the king of? To bear witness to the truth. If we're going to accept him as king, what are we going to do? We have to accept him bearing witness to the truth. To us. To everything that's within us. That doesn't match the code. That we could possibly be harmed. If we try to go up the mountain. He's got the truth. He, he's a king of truth. But he goes on. He says. Everyone who is of the truth. Hears my voice. Now I just think that is way cool. Everyone who is of the truth. So our objectivity in meeting. With Jesus. Is first of all to be absolved of our sin. Set free from Egypt. Have the Holy Spirit come. So that truth dwells with us. The spirit of truth. And as the spirit of truth dwells with us. At the bottom of the mountain. Eventually. We're going to begin to hear. The voice of Jesus. Do you catch that? Everyone. Who is of the truth. Hears my voice. I constantly try to teach people that it's possible for you to begin to hear the voice of God. The voice of our Lord Jesus. He said, my sheep hear my voice. But I want you to know it's predicated upon us coming. It's predicated on us coming out of Egypt. It's predicated on us realizing he's going to be our protector in this journey. Because, see, we need to know that because there's a lot of tongue lashings and a lot of emotional things that we have with each other and, and, and so-called problems we think we have that really have nothing to do with our relationship with God or really what is the truth of life about. It, it's not true truth. It's false truth that we get wound up in in our own flesh and in our own selves, about our own selves, about our own defenses. And it's emotions and hurts and so-called wounds that are somewhere in here. Show me the blood. Where's the blood? Where, where's the cut? You, you tell me it's so bad and you're hurting. Where's the cut? Where, oh, where's the broken leg? Where, where's your broken back? So where is it? It's in here. And if it's in here, what will fix what's in here? His truth. Because the enemy has got in there and he's put something false that's in there. And we need the voice of Jesus and we need his truth. So if we make him king in our life, he's king of truth. And if we'll just hold ourselves long enough at the bottom of his great mountain of truth and say, I need an encounter with you, Lord. I need your truth. 
And when we begin to accept everyone who is of the truth, when we finally receive his truth to where we're of that truth, then the things that the enemy says and the voices we hear no longer will hurt us. Why? Because we hear the truth. The only thing the enemy has to throw at us is falsehoods. And, and he is so brilliant in his knowledge. You'll hear things, you know, that person said that because of this. That person acting, you know, they've been watching you. They, they just think you are absolutely trash. I mean, and let me tell you about it. And the guy's just going on and on. And your little clock is he's in there with that wind up key going, <laughs> and you're, <laughs> you know, smoke alarms going off and everything else inside you because of the rage, the hurt, the anger. He, he deals in his perspective hurts and his perspective injustices that others do to you. And when you are focused in on that, you're drinking his truth. You put a big funnel on your mouth. Yes, feed me. Give me these untruths. I want right. I want a witness. I don't let that person do nothing. I'm telling you, we can't ascend the holy hill, can we? <laughs> Why? Because we're taking on some false things that are not truth. Those are things that the Egyptians used to do and the way they lived. And we're not Egyptian anymore. God has selected us as his people. And he's that priest in our midst that can officiate his presence so his presence can come. And we can be transformed into that which we are not by his revelatory truth. When he says, Curtis, uh, don't be a man of anger. I told somebody I was Irish the other day. You can't be Irish. You're not an angry man. <laughs> I'm Irish. I said, uh, that should be a real point to you of how great God's transforming power is. <laughs> I'm Irish. <laughs> it's God's transforming power. It keeps me from being that fire that is in the Irish blood, the fighting Irish. They got a name for a reason. That's my bloodline, used to. My new bloodline is the bloodline of Jesus Christ, the man of peace, the man of truth. And in his truth, if we assimilate his truth, then we can begin to hear his voice. And if we hear his voice, now there's more transforming power that comes from his voice and more, pr more truth from his voice. So do you understand the importance of the meeting and, and how we possibly get to that point that we can have a meeting with the living God? He, he has provided every measure there is to make it safe for us. I had to make it a joyful encounter instead of a dreadful encounter. A joyful encounter, if we get into those joyful encounters now and learn to meet with him now, then when he comes and splits the eastern sky and trumpets are blowing and the world is shaking in its boots and it's filled with the dread because the woes of God are coming upon the earth and you see a comet lined up to hit the earth and it's going to take out a third of mankind, a third of the ocean turn to blood and plagues will be released all over the land in every manner of torment and I mean it's going to be hell on earth then the angels saying hallelujah hallelujah <laughs> and if we have already had our meetings on a continual basis with a loving jesus and we've learned to obey his voice then it's not going to be a horrible terrible day for us we'll say Welcome, King Jesus. There he is. He's on a white horse. Oh, he's he's going to slay his enemies. But he is a living God. It's not going to be a terrible day for us. But we must know him. We must meet with him. So I would think that the gospel of the meeting is important truth that we need to hold within our hearts and treasure and run after to establish and say, help me camp at the bottom of the mountain, Lord. I'm not going to worry about the blasting trumpets. I'm not going to worry about your heat and your fire melting me down. I just, you hold your rod over me, Lord Jesus, until I can fully absorb all that truth, until it becomes a part of me that will have a passion that it's, a, that it's me, that I would fully embrace it and live in it. And when we do, then we begin to hear his voice clearly. Do you want to hear his voice clearly? That's his offer in the meeting, and we don't have to do it their way. 
And it's supposed to be a perpetual meeting with his rod and his staff comforting us. See, the rod and staff were for judgment and direction that the children of Israel looked at. Oh, man, he's going to hit me with that stick again. You know, like that Irish commercial thing, learning Irish, you know. If you don't agree with me, I'll hit you with me with a stick, you know. And, well, God, Jesus is not interested in hitting us with a stick. We're supposed to look at the stick and say, there's the stick. There's the rod of God. Oh, man, Jesus, would you lift it up over me? Just hold it up in the air. You won't ever get tired, and I'm going to stand under it. Because if I stand under it, all my enemies are put down. I'm gonna, you're my Jehovah Nisi. Hold your rod over me, oh God. It's not a rod of judgment that wants to bring judgment upon me. It keeps the enemy off my back. Oh, how we need these meetings. And I can go on and on about all the things that Jesus can pour out in these meetings that we're having and can't have with him. So don't fear when he calls you to his holy hill. But realize if you try to approach it on your own, it's treacherous. But Moses, God gave Moses specific instructions about how to sanctify the people, how to wash and how to be cleansed, that they might truly have a meeting with God. And how much more capable is our Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit of teaching us how to dress, or should I say, how to wash first? <laughs> Then how to dress. And then give us some, some table manners. Give us some etiquette about approaching him. So that he is pleased. This is the king of the universe. There's not any king in, in Europe. We don't have kings. But over there they understand kings. Man, they, they come in and they bound and never look up. It will cost you your head in any time that the kings were there. Even the Queen of England right now. I'm telling you, when people come in, they come in bowing. Now, God is the one that instituted kings. Now, you wrestle with that because he made that. And he said, he, that person is my magistrate. Why? Because they wouldn't listen to his prophets. And he said, fine, I'll give you a king. And I'm going to tax you to death. But they're my agent. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not going to mind them because you didn't want to mind me, they're going to come and they're going to beat the snot out of you. <laughs> they're going to extract your children from you. They're going to take your houses and your lands. You didn't want me over you. I was, I was a good king to you. I, here, here's you some kinks. God had instituted that too. But Jesus is the king of truth. And he's not come to beat us up nor bully us, but come and say, be still at the mountain. Come close to me and let me wash you. Let me examine you. Not to ridicule you or belittle you. But he's a great physician and he can heal our wounds. And he's a great physician. He can cleanse. See, the hurt has to be cleansed out of our heart. The hurt that the enemy planted there, that somehow you're not going to get what you want. Therefore, you need to act a certain way. That hurt precipitates as dirt. Do you understand that? Because it causes us and gives us justification not to be God-like, not to have the mind of Christ. So down at the foot of the mountain of the living God, Jesus is made a way full of grace, full of his presence, full of the outpouring of his spirit and the Holy Spirit, full of new clothes and new ways, Full of new desires and full of new hopes. All to be poured out upon us at the bottom of the hill. To prepare us for a mighty meeting. And he knows the pathways. And there's no splitting boulders. There's no exploding rocks. <laughs> there's no trumpets that would split your head open. There's not the punishing voice of God that all mankind will hear. Instead, there's the soft voice of Jesus. Come with me. Come with me up the hill. Learn my ways. Come to me. Come to me. He'll take a step up and then he'll say, come to me. And I'll say, oh, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, if I have to give that up. He said, oh, come up here. Come to me. You're going to perish down there. Come to me. Come out of yourself. So his beckoning call is soft and sweet and gentle for us to come up and have a meeting with our God. And he's made complete provision for the meeting. I think that is something that we need to rejoice about every day of our life. The gospel of a meeting is one of the most important truths that we need to hold. 
so that we'll be a chaser and a catcher of the presence of God. If you're not a chaser, you'll never catch him. And if you're not a catcher, that means you're not chasing him. Because if you run after God, he will find you. If you chase God, you can't miss him. So if you haven't caught him, you're not a chaser. So we need to become chasers. Because if you chase him, he said, if you seek me, you will find me. But what are you seeking? You're seeking a living God. You're seeking his audience. You're seeking a meeting with him through Jesus. Now that means that you're going to meet the Holy Spirit. You're going to be introduced to his truth and his word. If you receive his word, his truth, and you receive his spirit, the Holy Spirit will introduce you to Jesus so you can begin to hear his voice. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit can train you and array you and dress you as the bride of Christ so that he can present you to the Father on his arm. Look at my bride, Father. Look at my bride. There's much, much to be joined with God in this. There's much, much to be gleaned of truth from the king of truth that is so sovereign. It says, I want to meet you. Come and meet with me. Come and camp at the bottom of my hill. I can take care of all your problems. Come and camp with me. Lift up my rod over all your so-called problems and circumstances. Let it be your motivating factor that you keep your eyes upon and nothing else. Keep them upon me. Keep them upon my authority, my rod. For it is a comfort to you. My rod and my staff will comfort you. Comfort so that you can sit down as a little sheep at the bottom of the mountain and wait for Jesus to perform all these transforming acts within your heart so that you can meet with the living God. Shall we pray? God, I'm almost awestruck sometimes to think that you've called us to know you. That you said that you would meet with us? Oh, Lord. I can remember, <laughs> I, I can't remember all the times we've met. They're, they're, they seem endless in my life. But I can't live without meeting with you again. I can't live on yesterday's meeting. Oh, Lord. Teach us how to bed down at the bottom of your mountain. Teach us how to listen to your truth so that you can be our king and that we would substitute our truth for your truth. We would cast our truths far away from us and we would take on your truth so that we might hear your voice and have divine encounters with you, Lord. How gracious you are to say that there's even a place that we could meet with you. How gracious you are to protect us in that meeting. How gracious you are to make the way of sanctification so we could meet with you, a living God. Truly, you're a God of grace, tender and merciful. I adore you for it. In Jesus' name, I love you and praise you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. How about we do some worshiping?